So good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me over. Um, so I'm, I'll just be sharing some basic concepts on the social construction of gender sexuality and gender identity, just so we can see how, you know, like issues relating to gender and sexuality are viewed from a social scientific lens. And, um, you know, like it's important to always begin with how we use certain um, key terms with regard to the social construction of gender, also to clarify mis um, any misperceptions. So sex is all about the biological distinction between masculinity and femininity. And with that being said, there are also challenges that are posed by people who are born with ambiguous genitalia or intersex people, and they make up 2% of the population, give or take. And um, sex definitely pertains to biological features that relate to people's chromosomes, gonads, um, and genitalia. So it's all about one's anatomical features that determine whether one is me, uh, male, female, and intersex. Um, and gender is all about the social and cultural significance that we attach to biological differences of sex. And it also pertains to the identity and statuses that we ascribe to women and men based on social cultural distinctions. And, you know, like, while people tend to think that gender is something fixed, in reality, it's sex that is, uh, you know, like... Sex is anatomical, but it's the meanings or stereotypes that people attach to biological sex differences that lead to um, the, the, the way identities and statuses ascribed to women and men are imposed based on, based on social cultural distinctions, how people view femininity and masculinity. So um, as a result, gender divisions and their accompanying norms and expectations are part of major social institutions. And this is also intertwined with how we view sexuality or sexual orientation. With gender being a social status, legal designation, or personal identity, it is very central to people's identity as women or girls or as men or boys. And intertwined with this is how we view sexual orientation. The dominant cultural norms um, surrounding sexual orientation also influence how we see gender norms and, you know, like gender-related behaviors and trends. In any case, gender definitely matters in the sense of influencing everything from people's opportunities and life chances and how they're also treated across different social institutions. Where sexual orientation comes into play or sexuality, simply put, it's about the categories of people that one is attracted to. or And it's also very complex because it also involves how people classify themselves sexually. So we have to give people the freedom to claim whatever identity or identities they embrace for themselves um, in terms of their identities and activities as sexual beings. And, you know, on that note, there are multiple sexual orientations to speak of, be it heterosexuality, homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, omnisexuality, or pansexuality, asexuality, and so on. Um, sexual orientation is also very complex because it involves everything from desire, emotional involvement, and fantasy. And, you know, like, for some people, these three areas could be aligned. For others, you know what I mean? Like, who you're in emotionally involved with might be very different from whom you fantasize or desire. And it's just because people are different, you know, it's part of being human. And um, sexual orientation is also very different from sexual behavior. I think this is similar to some of the things that people touched on a while ago. How people identify sexually may be inconsistent with how they behave sexually. So, you know, like, it doesn't mean that, like, if you identify with any sexual orientation, you act on it. But, you know, if you act on it, it's also your business. You know, like, people make choices. Um, and also, like, you know, if you think about sex, that's the thing, like, even how we look at gender and sexuality is also tied in with the way we see sex. So in the Western world, Western culture is a very binary classification, that of male and female. But, you know, from another perspective, there are actually alternative classifications. Like in Indian culture, right, what's recognized is there are more than two sexes. So let's say someone is castrated they're eunuch, then, you know, that's a different category for sex. And from a chromosomal perspective, Anne Foster Sterling found that we actually have five sexes, including that of intersex people or people who are born with ambiguous genitalia because there's no one-size-fits-all model to being intersex. You know, even in the intersex community, there's also diversity. And one of the things to also clarify with respect to how the LGBTQ plus communities portrayed is, 
you know, like some here, at least here in the Philippines, I can speak on behalf of Philippine society. People tend to sometimes use the label third sex, quote unquote, to refer to the LGBTQ plus community. But then this mindset assumes that they're anatomically different. At the same time, referring to intersex people as the third sex assumes there's a hierarchy of sexes where men are presumed to be the first sex, women the second sex, and so on. So I often tell my students, don't use the terms uh, third sex when I teach um, gender and multiculturalism. Um, we have all these assumptions that are unchecked that determine and influence how we see sex, gender, and sexuality. The first assumption is that biology is destiny. It pert uh, pertains to the notion that nature, what one is anatomically born with, determines their social behavior where gender comes into play and sexual choice where sexuality comes into play. And it's also very important to examine the unchecked assumption of heteronormativity, which pertains to the cultural and social practice of upholding heterosexuality as the norm in the sense that, you know, people presume hetero everyone is heterosexual un unless they disclose otherwise. And a lot, in a lot of ways, this um, leads to the unfair stereotyping of members of the LGBTQ plus community in the sense that people presume if one comes out as anything but heterosexual, something happened along the way, you know, to make them this way, instead of realizing that uh, one's sexuality, regardless of whether they identify as heterosexual or part of the LGBTQ plus community, is simply who they are. Being um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and so on, um, is as natural as being heterosexual. So it's very important to reevaluate the belief that one's biological sex determines their sexual and social identity, their needs and desires, and sexual potentials, because this is often used against the LGBTQ plus community. For, in, uh, for instance, stereotypes where people would presume you're with someone of the same gender, but in the end, you look for someone of the opposite gender. You know, like it's an example of entrenched homophobia. Um, another traditional assumption is that there are only two sexes, male and female, and it reinforces the notion that male infants will become boys and men and female infants will become girls and women. And this is framed as a normal, quote unquote, and natural course of development as dictated by one's hormones um, and, uh, you know, gonads and so on. And this also leads to the third as a traditional assumption that the two sex order is supposedly a universal um, trend and the fact of nature. So this reinforces the notion that any deviations from the natural order, quote unquote, are mistakes of nature or of culture. This mindset is also used to exclude the intersex community and also other members of the LGBTQ plus community, other orientations, because people presume that when one is involved with or, uh, you know what I mean, like attracted to a member of the same gender. People presume that they deviate from the so-called um, two-sex order that's supposedly part of nature. Um, it's also important to look into gender identity as part of the discussion on sexuality. Because aside from, uh, you know, gender pertaining to our identities and, you know, the meanings um and expectations and behaviors we attach to femininity and masculinity, we also all have a gender identity which pertains to our internal sense of self as a woman, as a man, or another gender. And one's gender identity may or may not be based on their biological sex category. So we live in a society that does not only reinforce heteronormativity, but also a preoccupation and bias in favor of cisgender identity, which pertains to um, you know, someone who is comfortable with their assigned gender. Their biological sex is aligned with their gender identity. And it leads to the presumption that everyone is that way, that one's gender is also um, co consistent with their heterosexual orientation. People presume that if you identify as a woman, you would identify as heterosexual. If you identify as a man, you also identify as heterosexual. So non-heterosexual women and men are subjected to a lot of stereotypes, including the notion that lesbians want to be women, gay, um, gay people want to be, I mean, lesbians want to be men and gay people want to be women. In reality, you know, like um, one's, one's gender identity is also fairly complex. And um, for transgender, as a gender identity, this pertains to individuals with characteristics, behaviors, and self-identification and self-expression that's typically associated with the gender opposite of their biological sex. People also presume, you know, all these stereotypes about trans individuals, like the notion that if one is transgender, they're also transsexual, meaning they've undergone gender confirmation 
uh, surgery or so uh, others call it sex reassignment surgery but the preferred term in the trans community is gender confirmation because you know sex reassignment presumes or makes it sound like there was something wrong that had to be corrected or altered or fixed um, and it also includes people who take hormonal treatment and another stereotype that's often used also against trans individuals is that they cross dress meaning they wear clothing of the opposite gender but you know for trans individuals when like identifying with the gender they identify with means they dress according to the gender that they you know that they uh, that they identify with or that they embrace so this is different from cross dressing and institutions or uh, organizations that have policies against cross dressing quote unquote uh, end up perpetuating inequality and discrimination against the trans community Okay, so I put here trans um, trans identity. So for transgender people, you have individuals with characteristics, behaviors, self-identification, and self-expression that's typically associated with the gender opposite of their biological sex. So you have, for example, MTF or male to female um, or trans women, um, and then also FTM, female to male or trans men. And for, as I said, transsexuals, these are people who've undergone gender confirmation surgery or taken hormonal treatments. Um, trans identity, like being transgender is often presumed to be a sexual orientation, but in reality, transgender people are not always attracted to members whose gender is the opposite of the, the gender they identify with. Um, I put here some examples of, you know, like members of the trans community who are also involved with members of the same gender. So for example, Caitlyn Jenner is engaged to another woman. So you have a relationship between a trans woman and a cisgender woman. And then in the Philippines, this is Angie Mead King. Um, she came out as a trans woman, I'm going to say five years ago. And she and her spouse, Joey Mead, an actress in the Philippines, um, Angie is a professional or was a professional car racer. When Angie came out as a trans woman, um, Joey is a cisgender woman. People presume that Angie was gay. So the stereotype was people did understand that Angie identified as a woman. They simply told Joey Mead, so your husband is gay. And Joey Mead's response was, my husband is not gay. My, uh, my spouse is a woman. And they remain happily married and committed to each other. So it's, you know, like... Trans people can also be in, you know, bisexual. Uh, they can, ident can identify as bisexual, like um, Caitlyn Jenner and for Angie and Joey, they're in a committed relationship. As I mean, with uh, with fellow with another woman. So, um, as people presume that if you identify as transgender, let's say one identifies as, tra as a trans woman, they would want to be with a man, or if one identifies as a trans man, they would want to be with a woman, and this leads to the perpetuation of heteronormativity even in the trans community. Okay, and I put here some examples of discrimination against transgender people. In the Philippines, as well as in many other parts of the world, there are a lot of cases of discrimination against transgender people that are masked under policies against cross-dressing and policies regarding the use of the restroom, among others. In the Philippines, um, five years ago, Ms. Gretchen Diaz was arrested for using the women's restroom, and she was criminalized for it. People um, escorted her out of the building in handcuffs simply for using the women's restroom. And then in the league, system in the Philippines, as well as I, I'm, I would imagine in other countries also, there are cases of discrimination against transgender people in the legal system. So in the Philippines, for instance, Joseph Pemberton murdered his girlfriend, Jennifer Laude, and the re reason he gave was it's because he did not know that she was transgender. And the court here actually used this as a mitigating circumstance to lower his sentence and give him lighter treatment. And over the past years, I think like there was some negotiation about his early release. And then another form of discrimination against the trans community is dead naming. For example, using the birth name of a transgender individual, even if they've taken on another name that's more representative of their gender and their gender identity. So this functions as another form of gender discrimination and, you know, transphobia, definitely. Okay. Um, another gender identity is what you would call non-binary gender identity or NB for short. It pertains to um, a gender identity that's something other than being a woman or being a man or being neither male nor female. So this is both a gender identity and a catch-all term to describe gender identities other than those strictly pertaining to women and men. Sometimes people presume that non-binary people are automatically intersex, but in reality, Non-binary people may be any sex category. They may be biologically male, female, 
intersex. So the bottom line here is that non-binary people don't limit their gender identity to their biological sex. And, you know, like while their preferred pronoun is they, it's not applicable to everyone. It's To be on the safe side, always best to ask people, you know, or check with people how they want to be at called or addressed or what pronouns, you know, they identify with. Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, here there's an, uh, I just uh, showed some pictures of uh, people in, you know, like, um, who identify as neither, like, you know, who do not identify as exclusively a man or a woman. So you see here, actually, um, this, uh, like, uh, on the top, uh, no, what's this, the top, uh, top left corner is uh, um, someone from the intersex community. When um, when they came out as intersex, they also then identified as a woman, but later on um, embraced their identity as a non-binary intersex person. And then you, uh, the other photos are uh, members of the entertainment industry who also later um, disclosed that they identified as non-binary. So, you know, in this day and age, identifying as non-binary is also becoming increasingly visible, but also subjected to a lot of misunderstandings. And, you know, like it's also important to see that Non-binary identity is actually not, uh, it's nothing new because in other cultures, we have had historically third gender categories. Um, for example, I put here some examples across different cultures. In Afghanistan, you have the Bacha Posh. So these are girls dressed as boys and they take on the cultural roles of boys. But, you know, the, uh, except for they're not allowed or their culture does not um, embrace nor uh, allow for lesbian, you know what I mean, relationships. They simply take on the cultural responsibilities of boys. And then when they hit puberty, they're expected to take on the, you know, or to transition back to womanhood. And the Batsha Posh are often found in families where you don't have sons because Afghanistan is a very patriarchal society and not having a son in the family, people are looked at differently. And the sons are also um, relied upon to um, help their parents with economic responsibilities because of the conservatism of Afghan society. And then sworn virgins in Albania pertain to women who take on men's traditional work and family roles, and they also dress as men. Although it doesn't mean that sworn virgins are automatically lesbians. It's simply the case that, you know, in Albanian culture, it's very patriarchal. So a woman has to decide between, priority if she marries, she prioritizes her husband's side of the family, or she can be a sworn virgin where she'll take on more leadership and family roles, but, you know, remain unmarried. And then in the Native American community or in Canada, First Nation societies, this is actually an example of um, ethnic or indigenous communities that have always embraced um, being gay, being a lesbian, and so on. They use the term two-spirit that uh, translates roughly to women, men, and they, they believe that if you identify as a lesbian or as gay and so on, your body houses both a feminine and a masculine spirit. So um, for gays and lesbians, being uh, in the Native American and First Nations um, tribes, their being gay or being lesbian is actually not frowned upon. In fact, when they identify as two-spirit, it's celebrated in a ceremony. And afterwards, they're free to be in a relationship with or marry a partner of their choice. So you have women, men who are biologically male, who take up women's work, dress up as women, have sexual relations with men. And you also have men, women who are biologically female, who live as men, take up men's work, fight in wars, and marry women. And then in India, right, the, the hijras or eunuchs um, are neither women nor men are also and not necessarily seen as homosexuals. And they're distinguished by the absence of male genitalia, whether it's because of surgery on their own accord or ambiguous genitalia at birth. And then the sanith in Oman pertain to cross-gender behaving um, people, um, what's this, uh, people who are not men in the traditional sense. They are biologically male. Um, effeminate and they integrate both women's and men's traditional roles. So it actually shows that gender was historically and still is not in many societies associated or equated with biological sex or sexual identity. Okay, and then where sexual orientation comes into play, um, one of the disclaimers I put out here is we're using westernized um, categories to refer to sexual orientation and other societies might have their own respective terms to refer to sexual orientation. So heterosexual means one is attracted to the opposite gender and homosexual pertains to one who is attracted to the same gender and this covers gays and lesbians. Being a homosexual is different from what you would call situational homosexuality or people's involvement in relationships with the same gender or in environments where partners of the opposite gender are unavailable. So for example, in schools, in exclusive schools for girls and boys, there's actually more fluidity in terms of sexual orientation. 
but you know when people leave these environments they go back to heterosexual relationships being hom- and um this is different situational homosexuality is different from identifying as gay or lesbian um regardless of their environment bisexual pertains to someone who's attracted to both genders and um you know in many societies bisexuals also experience marginalization not only in you know like uh, the, um, as perpetuated by heterosexuals but also even within the lgbtq plus plus community there's the notion for example that bisexuals cannot make up their minds they're confused they want the best of both worlds or you know like they're experimenting um, because they still they're they're in denial about their sexuality and another stereotype is that bisexuals can't commit to a partner or one person only but in reality you know there are people who identify as bisexual regard and are happily committed regardless of the gender of the partner that they're involved with they still identify as bisexual and um for people who identify as queer um it's an umbrella term for people who don't identify with binary identities in terms of gender like they don't necessarily identify as a woman or as a man or sexual orientation they don't necessarily identify as heterosexual or gay or lesbian so this is also used as an umbrella category for non-heterosexual people and for people who don't identify with gender binaries um a term that's often used right now interchangeably with queer is as mentioned a while ago pansexual so people who have for example sexual and emotional attractions to members of any sex or gender including those who do not strictly identify as female or male or even those who don't necessarily identify as cisgender so you know like pansexual is a it's a term that en- uh, encompasses a lot of fluidity with regard to gender and sexuality and Another orientation actually is questioning which sometimes people don't take seriously. Questioning as the term suggests pertains to one who is questioning and exploring their sexuality. It doesn't mean that they're confused or that they're in denial. It just simply means they're determining what their sexuality is. And you know, this is also perfectly fine and healthy to be questioning one's sexuality. And then finally, another orientation is asexual pertaining to people who experience no sexual attraction. And Um, asexuals also experience stereotyping. For instance, one stereotype is that they're repressed in terms of their sexuality. In reality, asexuals are not repressed, nor are they homosexuals, gays or lesbians in the closet. They're simply not attracted to any gender. And another stereotype is that if one is celibate, they're not they're automatically asexual. You know, in reality, celibate people are of any orientation. It doesn't mean that if they're celibate, they're automatically asexual. Okay. Um I was going to mention um one of the like scientific studies about the social construction of gender and sexuality is actually um the Kinsey reports that came out in the 1940s. So as early as then, the Kinsey reports highlighted how sexuality is fluid, meaning it's a continuum. And definitely you can see political implications if and when people see sexuality as something that's a continuum rather than something fixed. What Kinsey, the Kinsey reports found out the two part series um discovered that for people people who identify as either exclusively heterosexual or as exclusively homosexual um at the time the study was conducted their history actually revealed that you know like not everyone um who identified as heterosexual was only involved with a partner of the opposite gender and not ev- not everyone who identified as homosexual was only involved with a partner of the same gender there was actually um a lot of fluidity for example people who were in heterosexual relationships had also previously been in relationships with members of the same gender or in other cases people who were in relationships with the same gender had also previously gotten involved with members of the opposite gender before coming out as gay lesbian and so on and there's also like for others some have uh, some got involved with a member of for example those who identified as heterosexual there were those who I, who had gotten involved with members of the same gender but after they broke up they went back to being with a partner of the opposite gender and for others who identified as gay or lesbian they had had maybe like re- relationships with members of the same gender but um i mean the opposite gender but later on went back to a relationship with someone of the same gender so in reality the seven point scale of kinsey shows that people are actually more bisexual than you know they care to admit and it just really shows the fluidity of sexuality i would say however because the study like of course the kinsey scale is dated it excludes other gender identities and other sexual orientation so trans people where would they fit in non binary people asexual people 
are not included um, for the most part in the seven-point scale of Kinsey. But in any case, this scale also highlights how sexual orientation is um, definitely different from gender identity. One can identify as gay, lesbian, and so on, whether or not they're cisgender, non-binary, uh, you know what I mean, transgender, and the like. And one can, like, let's say, one can also identify as transgender and be of any sexual orientation. And another important thing to highlight is that the categories we use surrounding sexual orientation and gender identity are also rooted in the culture. Okay, so over the last, uh, the late 20th and early 21st century, we've seen an increased awareness of LGBTQIA rights. And um, this also includes increasing awareness of transgender issues and the, in, the issues of intersex people alongside the issues of lesbians, gays, bis and um, bisexual people and queer people and even asexuals. There's also growing recognition of non-binary people, including third genders or third gender categories, whether it's in Native American culture, Mexican culture, Afghan culture, Indian culture, and the like, gender blenders, and gender variant people. So there's growing recognition of gender non-conforming individuals. And then also a greater appreciation of what's called queer theory, which highlights gender as a social construct. You know, it's um, reinforced according to the social and cultural norms that people attach to gender roles and even sexual orientation. But at the same time, queer theory highlights how gender is actually something that we perform in our everyday interactions rather than it being fixed. But on the downside, we also have ongoing gender-based violence as revealed in attacks and murders of LGBTQ++ people. And this also coincides with the attacks and murders of their advocates, including feminists, and then also minorities, especially who are gen those who are gender minorities and minorities based on race, ethnicity, and religion, and low income or poor people. So just to close, I wanted to share, like, um, in promoting a gender-inclusive society, the International Bill of Gender Rights highlights the need to express human and civil rights from a gender perspective. This doesn't mean um, only the inclusion of special rights for people with a particular gender identity or gender role concerns, but rather it covers universal rights to be claimed and exercised by every human being, including the right to define one's own gender identity, regardless of their chromosomal sex, genitalia, assigned birth sex, and so on, protection from discrimination in access to space or participation in activities by virtue of their gender identity. And finally, protection from wrongful psychiatric diagnosis or treatment, like the prejudgment as disordered, quote unquote, simply to undergo gender reassign, I mean gender confirmation surgery or to take to be um uh, to be cleared in order to take hormonal treatments. So, you know, like, because it's very problematic when members of the trans community, as they would often say, like, they have to be diagnosed as having something wrong with them just so they can be um, given permission to undergo surgery to be the, mem the gender they identify with um, or to take hormones in order to express their authentic um, selves as members of the gender they identify with. So... Uh, that's it for me. So, like, this is these are just some examples of a Pride March I attended in Canada a long, long time ago, and this shows um, uh, different sexual orientations and gender identities, also including allies who are um, one in promoting a society that's more, you know, inclusive and welcoming of all people, regardless of their sexual orientation and gender identity. And it's hope that you know throughout the world and even. Um, you know, in religious uh, settings, we can make these circles safe spaces where people will not feel alienated or afraid to come out and, you know, speak their truth regardless of their sexual orientation and gender identity. So thank you. Mm -hmm.